Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On today's episode, I'm going to welcome my friend, Coach Alex Pope, who now works at IMG Academy. But before we do that, just some quick housekeeping. Be sure to sign up and subscribe on my YouTube channel or any of the major podcasting platforms to make sure you don't miss an episode. You can also go back and watch some previous episodes to include the one with Chad Myers, who's the IMG postgrad head coach. So without further ado, on today's episode, I want to welcome my friend, Coach Alex Pope. Alex works in the basketball program at IMG Academy, and he came there from Vermont Academy, where he served at the head coach from 2014 to 2020. In his time at Vermont Academy, Pope developed seven top 100 nationally ranked players, two NBA draft picks, and one McDonald's All-American. In addition, the program won the school's first ever NEPSAC AA championship. And notably that year, he was also named NEPSAC Coach of the Year. Coach Pope has sent players to Harvard, Louisville, Vanderbilt, VCU, Miami, Xavier, Brown, Texas Tech, Marquette Butler, and many more programs at all levels of college. Uh, Alex also coached at the D1 level at Holy Cross, the D3 level at Middlebury, and the G League with the Springfield Armor, and EYBL with Expressions Elite. Alex actually completed a postgrad year at Northfield Mount Hermon before starting his basketball career at the University of Minnesota. He transferred from Minnesota to the D2 program at Assumption University, and he has a lot of experience. On today's episode, we talk about a lot of things to include uh, being a guard, how you become a better guard, what it's like to coach top 100 players, uh, what some NBA players he coached possessed to get them to that level. We discuss IMG and their academic team, the new name, image, and likeness uh, benefit that college athletes can take advantage of, and much, much more. So welcome to the show. Here's Coach Alex Pope. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. All right, Alex, well, welcome to the show. Good to see you again, brother. Let's get right into it. Um, you've coached at almost every level or played at almost every level except junior college and international. Um, so you've got this wide breadth of experience throughout your basketball lifetime. How has that affected you and helped you get to the point where you are right now? I think it helps me. Well, first and foremost, thanks. Thanks for doing this, Corey. Um, you've been great to me. We've had a lot of success. Um, and it's been a lot of fun listening to all of the, the, coaches that you've hosted on this show so thanks for including me um it's a pleasure it's an honor uh and i'm a fan of the pod um so again thank you Corey. <laughs> my pleasure it's so good to, having you on to, man. to answer your question i think um it just helps me when i'm working with families who you know come from many different backgrounds and have kind of a different, you know, understanding of, of what, you know, prep school basketball is all about and what they can accomplish with prep school basketball. Um, so I think meeting families where they are and having a better understanding of how they're going to get to where they want to go um, is the, you know, the best part of the experience that I've been able to um you know, accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you are now at IMG and we had on Chad Myers, uh, you know, quite a while ago on the, on the episode. So if folks want to learn about the IMG postgrad program, be sure to listen to Chad's episode. Uh, we'll link to that in the show notes, but you come to IMG from a NEPSEC AAA school of Vermont Academy, and you grew up in New England, played prep school there. You coached up there. Uh, in the college ranks and in the prep school ranks. So you used to espouse all the benefits of the prep school basketball world in New England. And now you've gone south of Florida to IMG, which is its own animal, which has so many great things about it. But now you've seen both sides. You've seen the New England prep school world, and now you're seeing the IMG world. Tell me a little bit now that you've stepped back from it, 
you know, and, and trying to be as you know, objective as possible, but what are the benefits you see still of the New England prep school world? And what are some of the challenges you see now that you're not in it and looking at it from a, a competitor's point down south? Oh, that's a tough one, Corey. Um, it is a tough one. We're starting out with some heavy hitters here. Alex, New England, <laughs> yeah, New England prep school basketball uh, is near and dear to the heart to me. And I think that um, every kid, uh, we t- you know, it's all about kind of meeting these families where they are, right? So if a young person, you know, I always use the 3X analogy of a young person, you know, what's their story, where are they at now, and where are they trying to go, right? Mm-hmm. Where have they been, where, where are they at, where are they trying to go? I think um, a lot of New England prep school programs are a great fit for, you know, certain individuals, right? But they're different. Um, and I think that the, probably the biggest challenge, um, would just be alignment, right. From the entire school, uh, resources, and then just kind of manpower, right. A lot of the prep school coaching staffs are, you know, head coach, assistant coach, occasionally, you know, you have three bodies in there. Whereas, you know, our, our model at IMG is unique where we have uh, just more manpower involved. So more manpower. What about this? Um, what about the college coaching exposure? So obviously in New England, you have so many schools concentrated where they can, within a couple hour drive, see a lot of kids. And you guys have colleges obviously around you in, in Florida, but just not the concentration. So um let me just throw this out here and you say true or false. True, there are more coaches that are going to see kids in New England at a prep school than would travel down to IMG. False. Okay. And you, you want, want to... me to get into it? I mean, I'm, I, I'm just curious. Wrote... It's a geography question, if anything, Alex. Sure. So I think two, twofold. One is we have more prospects on our campus than a traditional boarding school. Right, we'll probably matriculate, you know, 25 plus scholarship level kids um, in the class of 2022. Um, in the last seven to 10 days, I have the list on my whiteboard. You know, we've seen Alabama, Arizona, Brown, 247 Sports, George Mason, Georgetown, Gonzaga, Monmouth. Oregon State, Q's, um, not just high majors too, some mid majors, but we've had, you know, UV, UVA, Florida State, NC State, Houston, St. Thomas, which is in Minnesota, UConn, Baruch, FAU, University of Florida, St. John's, Auburn, Loyola, Chicago, Wake Forest, Marist, LSU, Iona. I could go on, right? Maine, UMaine was here. Um, and then, you know, we talked about how you can hit multiple schools in a short radius in New England. Um, I think one of the advantages we have here in Florida is there's a wealth of really strong junior college programs. So schools can come to IMG Academy and see, you know, 30 plus college prospects in that senior class. Then they can also visit with, you know, junior college programs. Yeah. And Mount Verde's not far away. You got DME Academy in the East Coast. You do have other schools down there they can make their rounds with. Okay. Perfect. Um, give me your pitch now. Say I'm a high, we're going to do this for three types of players, high major player, uh, an academic player, and then a player who might be on one of your uh, auxiliary teams. If I'm a high major player uh, and I'm looking at some of the top options to include overtime elites, um, your top New England prep schools, your Oak Hills, places like that. Um, why IMG if I'm a high major? Um, holistic preparation, you know, all things considered. I don't want to dive right into the comparison game. I want to emphasize, you know, who we are. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a strong possibility of us having four to five McDonald's All-Americans this year. So, we can certainly appeal to 
your five star prospect, Corey. Um, and we're certainly seeing that our, our kids are having success beyond IMG. So um, again, holistically, we're getting kids prepared for the next level. Um, what, was, what was your, you, you hit me kind of with uh, different layers to the question. Corey. I did, yeah. You said we'll the get high to... end kid who's a, you know, a top 100 guy, then, then who else? Yeah, well, well, just one note on that. You know, I sent a player to IMG. I've sent a couple guys there, and I sent a seven-footer there a couple years ago, and one of the benefits he mentioned was during the preseason, all these NBA guys are coming in to train. So here's an 18-year-old kid now going up against big guys in the NBA getting ready for training camp, and I, I don't know where else you can get that. And I had no idea that it was even going to happen, and it was a pure bonus for him and his training and I think that's a unique thing you guys have to offer. So just one little pitch for you guys there on that special, unique thing you guys offer. Um, so that's a high major player. And I don't, I'm not trying to compare you. I'm just wanting to hear your pitch, right? Like what Got you it. would say to them. So now the next group would be all academic. So I know you guys have started that team. And I want you to tell me more a little bit about that. But if I'm a high academic kid looking to go Ivy League, we've got our options out there. Your Northfield Mount Hermans with John Carroll. You know, your Exers, mm -hmm. your Andovers, your known high academic schools. And now I know you guys are trying to get in that market as well. Talk to me if I'm an all academic kid who's got Ivy's looking at them. Once again, is it coming to IMG just to take advantage of all the, the resources and the manpower? Is it the same pitch? Right. Well, let me revisit, um, you know, the, the first start, the uh, first part of your question, Corey, because um, I was just looking at John Rothstein's top 25 newcomers for college basketball, right? Four of those student athletes came from IMG Academy. Mm -hmm. And I would say 20 of the 25 student athletes in the top 25 were from programs where there was a lot of talent, right? So I think young, young people get the opportunity to play with other great players. Like you, you know, articulated going against other good players as part of the dynamic, but fitting into you know, a bigger picture being part of a puzzle and kind of executing a role is certainly a, a tremendous strength that we can provide here at IMG Corey. Um, and that certainly works for every type of player. And we are able to accommodate, you know, a myriad of student athletes because like you mentioned, we have different types of teams, mm -hmm. right? So, um, that's another luxury that we have, Corey, is the, the depth of our programming. You know, there's five teams on our, our campus that have scholarship level players. Um, one's ninth and 10th graders, right? You have a varsity two, you have a varsity national team that you see playing against Montverde and Oak Hill, you know, on ESPN, right? Uh, and then you have multiple post-grad teams um, with a lot of scholarship level players. Uh, and like you mentioned, one of those teams it has a, a focus on the academic component. And yes, there are, you know, other options out there for kids with, you know, high academic index. Say I have a fifth, uh, a student athlete from, you know, New York with a 1510 SAT and a 37 GPA. Of course, he's going to have a lot of attractive options, right? Um, but at IMG, we now have that, this academic program. So there's going to be a lot of eyeballs on that, that program from high academic division one. So that's attractive. And then, oh, by the way, you have warmer weather, strength and conditioning program off the charts, you know, nutrition, psychologists, and all the resources, the bells and whistles, right, that IMG can provide. Um, so there's a lot going on there, a lot of moving parts, Corey, but I do think that we can appeal to a wide variety of college prospects um, in this landscape. Yeah, with your all academic team, talk to me about the academic portion of that year. Um, obviously the, the schools in New England um, have the academics that is a seamless transition to an Ivy classroom, right? Exeter specifically, that's what they, they say. Um, do you guys offer um, either, uh, what, what do you offer academically for the academic team? Right. So 
we for our postgraduates we have three tracks Corey. um and this is another you know separator i think because there's kind of a one size fits all um type of model for postgraduates in in new england um from from what i know and from what i've experienced uh, our postgraduates though here at img academy can take college courses is one track called you know postgraduate college we can take high school courses postgraduate high school that's you know a, a popular route for our international student athletes it's also popular um you know i haven't seen any of these recently but i've worked with young people in the past where they need a class or two to get above the floor um so their gpa meets the scale so they're academically qualified for ncaa um we don't have any of those right now at img but i've seen that in the past so that's you know you had that flexibility post-grad high school versus post-grad college and then there's a sport only apd track where you're not in a you know traditional classroom as a student athlete here uh, as a postgraduate, but you would spend more time with athletic performance development. Um, so three different tracks, again, meeting the individual where they are, Corey. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for sharing that. Let's get back into your background now. And because you have an interesting story and I think you've got some great perspective to offer everyone listening out there. Um, just like me, you did a postgrad year as well. Tell me your decision making. Like when you were sitting around the table with your your parents, uh, senior at high school, where did you get the idea, and what was you know what made you decide to actually end up doing a post grad year? All right, so <laughs> I met with you know my my parents took me to uh, Italian restaurant in Lexington, Massachusetts, and met with Steve Gibbs, who actually is kind of the uh, the founder of uh, Hoop Mountain, which became Zero Gravity, now three-step you know three step sports. Um, and similar to what you do with families, he was a consultant who kind of, you know, led us in a particular direction. Um, and the decision was, you know, very much in alignment with what we talk about, you know, all the time with families, you know, the opportunity to grow, mature, and open up doors. And it certainly did provide that for me, Corey. Um, and the best part about the experience for me um, was the relationships. You know, the best man at my wedding was a teammate of mine at prep school basketball. And um, so I'm certainly a believer in the model because I lived it. And I think it, it helps to be able to kind of know what the, the student athlete is going through, mm -hmm. right? Kind of understand the ebbs and flows of the boarding school model, especially with the postgraduates, kind of knowing when they're gonna need a little bit of support, knowing when they're gonna you know, need to be challenged. Uh, I think all of that stuff um, is just really important. So I'm grateful that I was able to to experience postgraduate as a student athlete. Yeah, and you did Northfield Mount Hermon. What other schools were you looking at and why did you pick Northfield? Um, I visited Phillips Exeter. Jay Tilton actually you know, gave me my interview in their admissions office. Uh, I visited St. Thomas More and sat with Jer Quinn and saw all the pictures on the wall, you know, the Ed Codas and all these great players. Um, and then I saw NMH, uh, with Bill Batty and, uh, John Carroll was the assistant at the time. Um, and, and it just came down to, uh, the best fit academically, athletically, uh, but then with my family financially, you know, they were able to get a, um, a good financial aid package. So that helped. Yeah. That, that helps. And it's good you had a guy walking you through all that <laughs> and putting you in touch with the right fitting places. So congrats. That's it, because it was a for, totally foreign to me, and I grew up in the Boston suburbs, right? Wow. So it's like this stuff is a car ride away, and I'm a basketball junkie, and I didn't really know about this world. This is in the early you know, 2000s. 
So, you know, for families who are not from the Northeast or the East Coast, like anywhere else in the world, um, you know, this landscape is certainly unique. Yeah, that's interesting. You being a ball player up there, not even being as familiar, because I just assume everyone in New England that plays ball knows about this option. But that's that's good to hear. Well, now they do. Sure, it's really taken off, right? In the last twenty twenty five years, um, for a myriad of reasons, but it's really gained momentum. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you you okay? Let me back up here with this question. Every kid we talk to, what do they want to do? uh in college um play at duke in kentucky yeah it played d1 right that's probably 98 percent of the kids that reach out to us want to play d1 and obviously there's only so many scholarships available but one of the options is to walk on and some kids uh choose to walk on some kids uh decide not to do that but you actually chose to walk on tell us what college you chose and why you chose to do the walk-on route. Like what was your thinking going through at the beginning? And then tell us what the experience was like. And then what kind of eventually happened with that? Sure. Um, so for added context, before I start kind of rambling about my walk-on experience, I did end up transferring um, to a division two school, Assumption University in Western Massachusetts, which was a, um, a much better fit athletically. Um, but yes, you're right. I did, I did uh, pursue a uh, you know, preferred walk-on opportunity, um, went to the University of Minnesota. Um, similar to all recruiting, it was relationships built. Um, the foundation of it was my high school coach, Quentin Dale played junior college ball with Vic Couch, who was an assistant of Dan Munson at Minnesota. Dan Munson, the guy who built up the Gonzaga program, he, you know, the opportunity to coach in the Big Ten, I think, uh, at the time was a, a very uh, lucrative upgrade. Um, now Gonzaga is a whole nother beast, right? Um, but th yeah, the chance to, to walk on in Minnesota was very much driven by, you know, my long term vision of wanting to be a, a coach full time. And I wanted to be able to kind of experience, you know, what it looked like in the trenches. And I certainly got exposed to the business side of uh, high major division one athletics. And we were able to play in the NCAA tournament. Um, I was a hell of a scout team player, Corey. But um, what's most important with the best takeaway is like you, you nailed it on the head. You know, 99% of kids aspire to play division one. And when we're navigating the college matriculation process, I'm, I can speak to it firsthand. And I'll be the first to admit that unless you want to coach or, you know, work in sport, work in athletics full time, um, I don't recommend the walk-on route. And I try to scare kids away. Um, so almost similar to Charlie Brock at Springfield College, who tried to scare me away from from coaching college basketball. It's like, listen, this is this is ugly. This is nasty. Um, unless you really, really love it, and this is what you want to do, uh, I I prefer if you pursue, you know, other options. So, um, yeah, I try to share my story with every kid that kind of goes through that that process. Um, I believe that being an impact player at a smaller college is a, is a much better experience for most kids, but you know, all kids are different, right, Corey? But they are all different, but what specifically you being a walk on, did you not like, was it you're going to spend all this time and effort and bandwidth to never step on the court? Is, was that the main thing or did you, did you need more playing time? I mean, what was the thing? Cause you got there, you're probably excited. And then reality starts setting in what, what was the moment where you're like, you know what? I don't think this is for me. Do you remember? Oh, it was a combination of factors for me. You know, I mean, I was certainly grateful to be on a team that played the NCAA tournament. Um, and my room, I told you this, my roommate was Ryan Saunders, who went on to be an NBA head coach. So I have like zero regrets. I think the, 
the transition to, to division two was, you know, full scholarship on the table, the transfer, uh, playing time opportunity, knowing that, you know, I probably am not going to pursue, you know, playing overseas after college. So I was kind of at that crossroads where I just decided that I wanted to, you know, be a, a bigger contributor to a rotation, um, knowing that the chances of, of kind of getting on the floor and playing as a walk-on were slim. Yeah. And just, you know, I've explained this before. I just, just a quick recap. So, you know, I went to Air Force Academy's prep school and then went to Air Force because my goal, just like yours, was D1 or bust, right? It was. And I was six, seven. I have seven footers in my family. So I was waiting to hit my growth spurt. So, uh, you know, I was at Air Force and didn't play one varsity minute. You know, I was on the JV team for three years, waiting to hit my growth spurt, but I just was not good enough. But I wanted that chance to just get one second in a real game to get my letter just to say I did it. And I never did. Um, so should I have gone to a better fit D3 or D2 and got more minutes? Maybe. But I personally had to try D1 because five other members of my family had played D1 basketball. And it was my goal since I was a little kid. So what I'm trying to say here is everyone's situation is different, right? Like I've sent kids before, like one of my kids, Tyler Harville, um, who went to Vermont Academy before you got there, he scored 3,000 points in high school. And he walked on from Vermont Academy to St. Mary's, which is a top 15 program in the country. And he was never going to play. And guys that score points like that in high school, which I'm sure you did too, cannot go to a place and sit the bench. It just is not in their constitution. So with that being said, you know, with the 98% of the kids we talk to that want to go D1, you know, I have to then convey that to guys like you and say, hey, they want to go D1, but you know, I'm trying to let them know ahead of time too. Like, Hey, it's going to be tough to get a scholarship. And two, if you want to walk on, I tell them the same story that you tell me, told, tell, told me, and I tell them my experience and they have to be ready for that. And some kids are built that way, Alex, there's plenty of walk-ons out there, love their position and do it. But is that the best fit for you? And I think that's what benefit of prep school coaches where they can really hash out, especially during the open gym period. And I'm sure you see this at IMG. I'm sure you say, Hey, I know you want to go D one, but these are your D1 teammates. These are who's talking to them, all right? You could go to this school here that likes you, which will be a better fit, maybe better experience. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, no one's really going to care what level you went to. It's about the right fit in your experience. So you and I and all the prep school coaches are constantly mentoring these kids. And, heck, I was talking to Kevin Kehoe earlier today uh, about a player, and they're still D1 or bust. And he's like, okay you know and and they break it down realistically but i think i think once kids get on campus and they leave their high school and they're on uh an open gym floor with other kids from around the world that are a lot better than they are i think that's when the realization starts and they go oh i see these guys sometimes. are beaten. sometimes yeah you've still got those those kids out there that, that don't see that especially parents sometimes too but um Right. Everybody's child is, is better than they actually are. That's just the reality. And I can appreciate that. And I think a lot of, you know, above average to really good players think they're better than they are. So that's a competing factor, Corey. I think the question to put on the student athlete who is, you know, running that race and they're at, you know, they're at decision time and they really can't see themselves being anywhere else other than division one is, well, what do you want from the experience? Mm. Because coming into a big time blue blood program, um, we'll say in the ACC as a walk on who had no other division one offers, here's what your situation is going to look like. Here's what they're going to expect from you. Here's what your role is going to be. Sure you will get a lot of cool gear and a lot of, you know, sneaker boxes that are orange will be, you know, filling up your, your, you know, your, the lobby or your, uh, your mudroom. That's great. But what do you want from the experience? Right. Yeah. What do you want from the experience? Can you see yourself, you know, going here and not playing, you know, a minute in conference play, because even if you're just as good or close to the eighth or ninth guy, he's on full scholarship. And there's an assistant coach on that staff who recruited that young person 
right? So they're very much invested. And he came from an elite AAU program and a really good prep school. So there's folks breathing down the neck of that assistant coach. All of those things are competing factors where it would be extremely difficult for you to frog leap the scholarship athlete in the rotation. Are you going to be comfortable with that? Are you going to be enthusiastic showing up every day to execute, you know, a, a scout team role? Um, and again, that's why I kind of go back to like, if you want to be a basketball coach and you want, or you want to be a, you know, a future, you know, GM, this is great because it's, it's, you know, you get a, a great opportunity around influential people to execute a role, right? To execute a role that's not easy to do for young people. But again, um, it's, it's a conversation that, you know, will, it does come up annually. And I think uh, the experience that you and I have gone through only helps. Yeah. And I think that's so valuable. You mentioned about the scholarship players and assistant coaches the walk-on might be better, but people will look bad if you play over scholarship players. And I don't think that gets said enough. I think walk-on kids, and you thought this, heck, I thought this, well, we'll earn our, our minutes. And if you're busting your ass, you're outperforming guys in the court, which has happened to some of my previous clients who have walked on, you got to be able to know exactly what you just said about how the, the power structure works, right? And I don't think that gets said enough. And I don't think, you did you know that? when you decided to go to Minnesota that that was the case or did you learn through hard knocks? Um, combination of the two. Okay. I mean, I, I had to go for it. Like you articulated, I had to go for it. And, uh, that's, that's kind of who I am as an individual. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, gr I'm glad I went for it. It was great for me. Right. Um, but again, when you get to know these youngsters, and you develop relationships with them, you, you can understand that most kids, um, you know, would be better off pursuing a small college opportunity at a division two or division three. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I went and coached right at, at Middlebury college and Springfield college. So, um, I also speak to my experience there where those young people had, you know, incredible experiences. And they were able to win a lot of games and, you know, be, you know, monster contributors of college basketball um, teams that, you know, nobody can take that away from them. So yeah. there's a lot of opportunity out there, Corey. Absolutely. It's all about fit. All about fit. You hear guys like you, me, and prep school coaches saying that over and over again. One, to find the prep school, and then two, in choosing a college. Uh, let's get into a, a topic here you know a lot about, and that's guards. 99% um, of the people that reach out to me and you are guards, right? And everyone, you know, 98% of those want the D1 spot. And there's only so many. And the, the line is so fine between uh, high to mid-major, mid to low, low to D2, et cetera. It's such a fine line unless you have freakish ability uh, athletically or um, – you know, good size for a guard. So give a prescription here. If you've got a high school kid, that's a guard, you know, what are you going to tell them to do if they want to play in college and then get to that, start bumping up levels? Like what does each level does a guard have to possess and what can they do, Alex, to get to that level? What's your prescription? Um, well, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging would be the first thing I would say. Um, when I was visiting Stanford as an assistant coach at Middlebury, they were having, uh, their elite camp. Uh, I think this is back in 2012. I think it was Mike Schrage, who was an assistant there. He's now the head coach at Elon. He gave a little mini lecture to the guards because there was, you know, position breakdown at this elite camp. And the first thing he talked about was supply and demand, right? So mm -hmm. I think for youngsters to wrap their minds around how difficult it is, I think starting with the fact that there's just so many more guards out there in the market than front court players. So kind of understanding how incredibly unique you have to be to be a scholarship level guard is a good start, right? It's a good start. Um, and then I think that, you know, you could jump into 
the analytics of, of the, the matter, like, you know, you want to have that two to one, three to one assist to turnover ratio. You want to be probably 90% from the line, which is extremely challenging to, to accomplish. Um, and then somewhere, you know, above 50% from the field and 40% from three, um, that should be kind of what you're striving to, to accomplish. Um, and it's, it's rare, extremely rare at this level. Um, but if you were in that ballpark, that would probably mean that you're skilled enough. Right. And then I think the athleticism and the size, you know, you have to be remarkably quick as a smaller player on the floor. Um, and then last but not least, you know, are you a proven winner? Have you been able to impact winning? Do you come from a winning program? Um, I think if you have, we talked about this earlier in the summer, you know, the, the three dynamics I pointed out were shooting, quickness in the pick and roll, or just quickness in general, and then being a winner. If you have two of the three, you know, you got a chance. You got a chance. Can you get quicker as a guard? I mean, some of that's God given, but how much skill work can you do to actually bump that up? What percentage right. do you think you can improve it? I, you can. I think, you can. Get I think quicker. so. So, yes, okay. Think, so you can add the quickness, right? That's one thing. You can improve shooting. I mean, yeah. Ex experience in the weight room. Like, I, I don't think you can get faster. I think you can get quicker. Quicker. It's like yeah. a mental thing. Yeah. Okay. So, so shooting can, you can improve as well. Right? Quick can you, quickness, you can get better. How about a winner? Like, how do you have a prescription that someone follows to become a winner? Or some of that inside um, your heart that you just have? Yeah. I think, um, I'll go with um, yes. Is it's inside you, but I will also add that um, you've got to have some good fortune of being surrounded by good people, right? Like your inner circle, and you know the program or or you know the coach that you're playing for plays a monster role in all of that. Um, you know, it's why the college selection process is so important, right? You get around the right people. You are who you spend time with. I always, always mention that in the recruiting process. So um, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, uh, Joe Mantanga from Blair used to tell me that. Recruit families, you know, not, not players, not athletes. So I think um, the winning component is kind of who is in that person's circle, you know, because Nothing and nothing great is accomplished alone, right? Yeah. So if our prescriptions for guards be as strong as you can, be as fast as you can, be have your analytics down. So make sure you've got those certain percentage marks you hit, ideally, right? This is something you can aim towards. Um if you're around a losing program, if you're at a public school around a losing program with a losing coach that just doesn't get it, you're kind of screwed right there. So maybe you find a successful AU program with the guy you want to be around. Um, have a high IQ. You have to have a high IQ as a guard. So you can always get that watching games, listening to coaches. Um, I'm just trying to think because let me add. Let me add to the um, the 90, 50, 40 ratio. You know the percentages and the two to one assist to turnover ratio is. You know, can you get paint touches right? Do you have a little bit of wiggle? Because there's always mm. going to be a high. Uh, demand there's a, it's a premium if you can get the ball to the paint and then make plays from there i think that's a you know a monster part of it um and conversely on the defensive end is can you keep uh, you know guys out of the paint right and let's um, go back to the book gatekeepers you recommended to me right let's say you've got two guards exactly the same they're clones right but one takes charges one doesn't the kid that takes charges is going to be better right both are clones. This one has a 3.5. This one has a 2.8. 3.5 is going to win. This one's a student body president. This one's not. He's going to win. The more interesting you are as well, if, if we're talking two identical players, you're going to be taken. So, yes, you want to specialize in basketball, do as much as you can, but you also have to have those, those attributes that separate you from the pack. Since there are so many guards out there, and they're very similar in a lot of aspects, what else do you have? At the prep schools, you know this, 
there's certain boxes to check, right? If you're a good basketball player, that checks a box. If you're from a part of the world or country that's not represented there, that checks a box. But if you also have um, speak a second language or play the piano or start at a club at school or volunteer at a soup kitchen, those additional things make you more interesting as a person and someone that a school and a team is going to win around versus just guys that are strictly focused on basketball. That's great. But when there is such a fine line, like the fine line there, you, you just have to find separators. And those are kind of things that do that. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I think going back to who's in your circle, it really helps to have people um, who can radiate, you know, your story to the right people, right? Like, I think if you're going around kind of like uh, politicking and promoting yourself, that's that can be challenging. Or like your parents are doing the promotion, you know, I think having the right people in your corner who are respected and experienced to be able to kind of share that those little intangibles, I think is really, really beneficial. Absolutely. Um, one, one thought popped in my head, Corey, too. It's like, it's so important for experienced individuals who are well-connected to be able to, sh to kind of add the necessary context, because if the, you know, traditional recruiting model is incredibly flawed. There's not enough time for college coaches to truly, um, you know, execute um, a re really good evaluation. So what we see annually is players who have high usage rate, meaning the ball is in their hands a lot, players who have height, you know, the taller players, and then the players who get the bulk majority of the playing time on the, um, you know, the, the premier circuits that are out there in grassroots basketball, those are the dudes that get over recruited or get recruited. Right. And 95% of the sport is played without the ball. Mm -hmm. So the fact that usage rate gets over recruited tells us that the recruiting model is extremely um, flawed. So again, kind of having, folks in your corner is imperative so that's where you to explain that a little bit more if 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 the usage rate is overutilized are you saying that coaches aren't watching guys move without the ball as much or they don't take that as high into consideration or what are you talking um, defense as well are you talking more right, about well this there's there's data out there that backs this up too this isn't just like my wild you know random philosophy to poke holes you know, in the, the IQ of college coaches, because I don't think anybody works, any industry works harder than like assistant coaches at the division one level who are recruiting. It, it's, um, you know, it's wild stuff. Those, those guys really, um, they're all in, but um, just the data, right, alone backs up that the guys who have a uh, high usage rate at the high major level see recruitment. So, I think it's just a human flaw, right? We, when you're watching, you know, 10 AAU games for five days in a row, um, you know, your pro your eyes are gravitating towards the ball. It's, it's easier to kind of figure out what the player, what the individual does. And I think because of the nature of AAU being more of a simple game where there's less detail um, in the preparation and the coaching off the ball that, you know, what are you really going to see that translates to college basketball? Right. Um, I mean, you'd like to see guys that, you know, sprint the floor and, and get 10 rebounds a game, get higher recruitment, but, um, most high majors are looking for the 20 point score. Yeah. Unfortunately. Right. So again, if you're at a program that has experience and you know well-connected coaching staff, um, then it, it's much more likely that you can come off the bench and be a role player and still go to the highest level, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's good stuff there to hash out. Let me ask you this. Um, we're going to have our segment now called Famous Alumni from Your School. And uh, we did not do this with Chad a, a few episodes ago, but, you know, looking at your Wikipedia page and what you sent me, there's so many famous people that have come through. They're famous athletes, maybe not to go to school, but to at least train. 
So I'm going to let you take the lead on this and give me um, your three most interesting IMG alums that uh, really just show what you guys are about. Okay. So what, who's number one for you? Uh, Dwight Powell. Okay. He's, he's our poster child because he was a four-year IMG Academy student athlete. Um, went to Stanford. And now he's making a lot of money with uh, the Dallas Mavericks. So that's, that's got to be number one. Uh, number two would probably be Anthony Simons for me because I got the coach against him at Hoopal. And he, he went for, you know, 35 points that day. And he made it look easy. You know, mm-hmm. it looked like he had 20, one of those guys. And he uh, most recently won the slam dunk contest. Went straight from uh, his postgraduate year to the NBA. Um, so I love that story. Um, put me on the spot here. I think the the last one will be another guy who I coached against, uh, KJ Martin. Um, KJ Martin was unranked, you know, wasn't a five, he wasn't a five star, wasn't a four star, wasn't a three star. He was a no star, you know, wasn't even in the top 350. Comes and does postgraduate at IMG and then plays himself into the NBA draft. And now he's with the, the Houston Rockets. So that's my big three off the top of my head. I'm sure I'll uh, scratch my head on, you know, not saying uh, so-and-so and another guy, but um, those are the three that come to mind. Yeah. And the fun thing about visiting IMG, which I've done a couple of times is uh, whenever I've walked around uh, with, with one of the members of the staff to including you, you know, you guys point out like, Oh, that girl over there stretching. She's the top 15 year old golfer in the world that guy there he's the lead uh reliever for the washington nationals and you guys constantly have people coming and going and you know on the list of people who've trained there uh, includes andre agassi you know the williams uh serena and venus williams at, at maria sharapova etc 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 so the people that you know come through that campus on a weekly basis you, you must have seen um some of the top performers in the world come through there during your time it is energizing that's for sure. Yeah. Now that was this week's episode of top alumni <laughs> from the prep school. So thank you for uh, you actually providing that this week, Alex. Um, when you were at Vermont Academy, you coached a couple NBA guys. Um, tell me what it was like to coach them and what they possessed that ended up getting them to that league or to the league. Okay. Um, The first uh, young man uh, was Bruce Brown. And I think what separated him was his motor, his coachability, and then his compete level. Um, Kind of one of those guys that doesn't matter if you're playing Monopoly or, you know, kickball on a Saturday night. Um, He wants to win anytime it's competitive. Right. And he was a, you know, a below average three point shooter in high school. But to give you an example of of how special he is, anytime we would have a a competitive shooting drill, he would somehow find a way to to win. And we had some really strong shooters uh, that were on that that roster. So uh, for him, it was the compete level and the coachability. I mean, you could ask him to do anything. If it impacted winning, he would do it. Um, wasn't concerned with any, what anybody thought of it, uh, just wanted to help his team win. And now we're seeing it at the highest level on the biggest stage. He's a six, three guard and he is ball screening and rolling to the basket. Um, you know, ball screening for James Harden and Kevin Durant. Um, and he's basically a center in the NBA on a, you know, a championship contender after playing, you know, point guard and shooting guard, um, you know, in grassroots basketball. So it's really cool to see. It's a great story um, because a lot of kids can get distracted um, with what position they are. And the game has become positionless. And I think that Bruce Brown is a fantastic example of that. Um, The second guy I coached who is in the NBA uh, is Jordan Wara. And uh, he's with the Milwaukee Bucks. He won a NBA championship this year. And, and then uh, a couple of weeks after that went to the Olympics 
uh, with Nigeria. Uh, and for Jordan, uh, late bloomer, right? Didn't have a single scholarship offer at the division one level until he chose to do postgraduate. Um, his special uh, quality attribute is shooting. You know, he's six, seven, and he is, you know, an automatic shooter. So I think having a special attribute um, is probably, you know, the best way I could describe how Jordan was able to, you know, become an NBA player. Yeah, that's interesting. Now tell me this, you mentioned Bruce had a motor. Can you develop a motor? I've never asked that before. I just, it just popped in my head. I don't, because you know, those guys that just can just play full speed for hours. And I don't know if that's something you can condition for. Tom Kachowski, the, the glider, uh, rest in peace, uh, once wrote about Bruce that he had the metabolism of a hummingbird. And that really stuck home with me. So a lot of it, uh, for sure, is just kind of his DNA, his upbringing. But I do think that um, there are, you know, coaches who can bring even more out of you. Um, when I was at the University of Minnesota, an assistant coach named Jim Molinari, who's actually now on staff at Boston College, um, he was a good example of, of a coach who could cultivate um, higher motor for his players, you know, through drill, through station work and accountability. So um, I think probably 80% of it is kind of, you know, God given and probably the rest of it is, you know, what type of environment you're in. Yeah. Um, coaching top 100 players, which I know you've done, like, how does that make, what are the benefits? In the, and I asked Tom Espinosa this recently, but what are the benefits and what are the challenges of having those kids on your roster? And I'm talking back from when you were the head coach at Vermont Academy. I think benefits um, is it supports the admissions model and no matter what prep school you're at, um, because guys want to play with other good players and they want to play at programs that have a track record of strong matriculation. Um, I think it, it brings brand recognition and notoriety to your program. And then it also uh, enhances your schedule mm. because you have a couple top 100 players. Um, you're going to get invited to all the bigger events. So the rest of your team can inherit, you know, stronger exposure. Um, I think the challenges of coaching a top 100 player at this level, Corey, would probably be navigating the politics, especially mm -hmm. when the decision time comes, when it's time for a young person to, you know, commit to a college or whatever they're going to do next. Um, that can be tricky to navigate. There's just a lot of folks who, you know, have high expectations and um, it's hard to keep everybody happy um, in, that, in that scenario. Uh, what's been my North Star, Corey, is just kind of let's just do what's in the best interest of the young person. You know, open up as many doors as possible for that young person and allow them and their family to make the best decision um, in the best interest of their family. You know, like I never would promote uh, young, for young people to be selfish or greedy, but when they're picking their college, like that's a business deci decision for them and their family. So I just kind of, you know, I'm like Switzerland over here, you know, just, you know, but I'm there to support them. Yeah. And speaking of that, I want to segue into the NIL, uh, the name, image, and likeness. And that's really hit the ground running with that. Um, I want you to think about this from, you know, helping the top 100 players at Ramon Academy and now with the players you have at IMG. Um, does that come into uh, consideration now? Like, it, does your staff at IMG talk to your players and, and, and talk about, hey, this school is great, but this school you might potentially earn more money through NIL. Does that enter the conversation now as far as recruiting goes? Well, I think there isn't a, a lot of, uh, of data out there to support anybody's position. So 
it feels like it's important to educate the young people to the best of our ability, but then also point out the unknowns. And we know that the college coaches are, you know, making their best pitch, but they're also, you know, pitching kind of an unknown hypothetical. Um, so I think kind of understanding, you know, the realm of possibility is, is wonderful, but then being realistic about, you know, how, the outcome could kind of vary uh, is important too. And I think if I were to kind of prioritize the decision, um, like if I were to kind of like list out what are the most important things in making this decision, I'm not sure NLI um, would be at the top. So it's like really important to kind of factor in all the different variables because you're probably going to have the best NLI opportunities if you find the best fit for you as a student athlete. Um, if that makes sense for you. I mean, I just think it's all a puzzle. Yeah. You know, there's two ways to look at this one. You've got your one and done guys, right? And we've seen this recently with Memphis where a kid can go to the G league or he can do a year at Memphis and make a pretty, pretty good chunk of change. Um, so I think that's going to be part of the recruiting pitch now. Like I think when you sit in one of these high major offices and they're going through their slideshow of their offense, this and that, I think one of the slides is going to be earning opportunities. Right. And, you know, Mike, here's a hypothetical. Um, so say you got a kid looking at two colleges and he's, he's torn. They're both great coaches meet his needs and everything, but one school, he can make double the amount potentially through NIL, if everything's equal otherwise, should he take that option? Should that, you know, even though it is kind of the Wild West, we don't know yet, but should that be a factor now in picking a school if you're torn? Well, if you have that type of opportunity, then you're probably a really attractive, you know, player, ball player. So you're going to have a lot of opportunity in general is kind of my thing. So if you're in the, you know, hey, we could make, you know, millions of dollars off of this scenario. I still think that the best fit mm. on the court um, would be most beneficial in the long term. Um, so that's kind of my stance on it. However, um, for teenagers, um, sometimes it can be hard to kind of understand the big picture and, and remain long-term greedy. But again, if I'm prioritizing you know, what's most important. I think if, if you're, you know, if you have opportunities to make a lot of money, then to me, you probably would have a lot of opportunities at a lot of different schools. So finding the best fit um, on the court, um, socially, um, geography wise, like I, I still think that all that's going to be more important. Think about this, this, this make Alex Pope uh, a walk on this year as a freshman in Minnesota, like you could technically start cutting your own deals, right? I mean, you've got boosters in the Minneapolis area that love the Gophers. You got a sandwich shop you could tweet about and get free food for a semester or something. Like even you at the end of the bench have potential earning options, right? Especially if you got a little bit of a personality, maybe a little bit of a following. So, like, I, I think in a year from now, kind of like COVID, like when COVID started, we didn't know what was going to happen, and now looking back, we can kind of see the pitfalls. Now looking ahead at the NIL and what could potentially happen. I mean, we're seeing guys at Alabama making a million dollars without even having a snap yet. So that's like the potential out there. That's the extreme. But I'm really curious, like at Assumption, like what's going to happen there? What's going to happen at Middlebury? You know, are there going to be some kids that can incorporate that into their uh, helping with tuition or, or something like that? So to me, I think it's fascinating. But back again, does, does IMG, have you guys talked to your top players about NIL at all? Well, because it's all so new, um, you know, what we're doing is just kind of like creating a, a foundation, uh, a foundational understanding, right? And then kind of like monitoring all the different, you know, pitches that are out there. But it's, you know, to your point, like we're going to find out a whole lot um, here in, in the immediate future about the, the possibilities here, right? Uh, and I think that um, one of the, you know, advantages we have at IMG is, 
we have such a high ceiling because we're, you know, we're, we can pivot and we can kind of, you know, explore, you know, different opportunities and different avenues um, at a higher clip than a traditional, you know, boarding school that's been around for 300 years. So um, it's certainly a hot topic around here, as you can imagine, with, you know, nine players in the ESPN 100 on our campus right now and 20 football players in the top 300 taking the field tonight for Friday Night Lights. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, different types of discussions on different layers. And then you have the college coaches that are, you know, frequently stopping by and visiting with our student athletes. Uh, so it's an exciting time. Um, I just think to kind of answer your question, Corey, it certainly has not been defined. Okay. Um, and there's no like, all right, this is where we stand on this. Um, so I think um, it certainly feels like an art more than a science at this stage. It's going to be so interesting to see the deals that happen. It really is. There's going to be some surprise. There's going to be some un enterprising kids out there playing college sports that might not be the most talented, but just find a niche that they can exploit. And uh, I, I think there's going to be some great success stories in a year from now. We had an assistant coach from – Notre Dame here this earlier this week and he told me there's been some conversations that you know he's been disappointed by because recruits are exclusively interested in the possibilities of NLI and less interested on you know in the education less interested in the style of play less interested in you know relationships. And I think that one thing that I would kind of hammer home to our youngsters is, you know, this is a great opportunity and, you know, could provide, uh, you know, some economic uh, worth. However, to sustain success uh, financially, you know, you're going to want that fantastic education, no matter how long you're at that school, you're going to want to cultivate meaningful lifelong relationships at this college. Um, and you're going to want a great experience on the basketball court. So I think, um, you know, take our, our youngsters to, uh, to business class one-on-one. Hey, like there's a lot of moving parts to be um, a success in the long term, and don't just exclusively be concerned with how much money can you make as a first year player, um, no matter what college you go to. Absolutely. And you know, what we're going to see, we're talking about the numbers we're going to see on the outside, right? The public numbers. How's that going to affect the dynamics of a locker room when there's different deals? It's almost going to be like a pro locker room now. And our kids are going to be focused as much on studying or hustling to get another deal. So once again, this is going to be a lot that's going to be hashed out. And I think, there's going to be some amazing stories. I would love to follow um, just kind of how this works at like a high major program, a mid major, a low major, maybe a D3 and just have someone kind of follow like a John Feinstein who could like, um, who does that anyway, when he follows teams for a season and just find out after 12 months, like what it looks like at each level. Is it a pain in the ass if you've got these high earners in a locker room or one's getting more shots than another? You know, what, what's a smart, be, what's a D3 be. kid at Middlebury who's got pretty good grades doing what, how is he hustling, you know? So, yeah, that would be, yeah, that would be must, must see TV, Corey. Uh, you know, you, you probably make a lot of money pitching that to Netflix or, or somebody Hulu. Um, mm -hmm. uh, no, you're on to something there. It's, it's going to be um, a whirlwind. All right, let's do some quick hitters here to finish up. Who has shown up during your coaching career and been the biggest surprise for you as a player? Wow. Um, and while you're thinking about that, I just want to tell the, the listeners out there, prep school coaches recruit kids and they don't always see them in person. They just see highlight videos and game tape. So once that first practice or open gym happens in August, coaches are sometimes ah, the players as expected. Sometimes they're worse. Sometimes they're a surprise and better. Um, so it's kind of like Christmas morning every time the first open gym happens. So when in that instance, 
as uh, you opened up that Christmas present and it's been better than advertised. Uh, wow. Okay. So before I uh, took a prep school job, I was coaching at Holy Cross with Milan Brown. And I have to mention the story because, you know, I'm, here I am uh, transitioning from uh, Middlebury to Holy Cross, but, you know, it's still a Patriot League. And we had a young man named Malcolm Miller who won an NBA title with the Toronto Raptors. He was a, an incredible surprise because he was a high major uh, basketball player that somehow slipped through the cracks and was at Holy Cross. Um, that was a, you know, a fantastic story. Um, but, you know, six and a half years as a prep school head coach, um, I saw a couple ones that stand out. Uh, Marcus Santos Silva was on the BABC B team, um, 6'6", like probably 230, over a little overweight, shows up to campus, um, you know, and we're like expecting him to be, you know, five minutes to, to give, uh, you know, Tyreek Jones a quick blow so we can get him back in the game. Um, and he wound up um, really blossoming and having over 25 scholarship offers. He chose VCU over Kansas State, Boston College and Temple. Um, he just got He played himself into shape. Uh, his hands um, were better than I anticipated. He rebounded everything. He really understood how to execute a role as a front court player. Uh, and he was a gym rat. So I think, uh, Marcus Santos Silva, I mean, he's actually still playing college ball and he's taking advantage of the NLI. He's got a couple different deals and he's at Texas tech. He transferred from BCU to Texas tech. And the other one is our guy, Rafe Ayers, who, you know, on the film, um, I couldn't really get a great feel on his toughness and his athleticism. I knew he was a winner coming from Murray in DC. I knew he was a, sh a tremendous shot maker, but I didn't know what his, like his consistency, his toughness, um, and his, um, you know, just willingness to compete every single day that, you know, I couldn't, uh, find that out on film. So those two guys were pleasant surprises. Um, and both of those cats made me look pretty good because their matriculation, um, you know, surprise some people. Yeah, absolutely. No, Ray Fair is one of our guys and uh, he's doing great now at Missouri State. So um, what's the biggest win of your career? Oh, um, well, I, I, I just, I think about some of the losses first, Corey. I think I have some of the loudest losses in prep school basketball. Um, we were invited to the we were invited to the hoop hall uh, five out of six years, and um, every single year we had new scholarship offers after that event. And um, sadly enough, my overall winning record, win loss record at the hoop hall was zero and five. Right. So, but people are more interested in the fact that we were able to get guys college opportunities at the Division One level. Nobody seemed to be too concerned, you know, that we dropped a game to St. Thomas Moore or IMG. Um, but I think uh, looking back on all of it, the sweetest win um, was beating Cushing in 2016 to win a AA NEPSAC championship, the first one of its kind uh, at other Vermont Academy. That was a really uh, a cool feeling and a, a great team to be around. That's something I'm pretty nostalgic about this is off the subject but what was it like coaching at Northfield Mount Hermon for the first time your alma mater it was strange at first and there were so many good players on the floor that I definitely had a moment where I was kind of like is this really happening you know <laughs> like uh, pinching myself there's like high major coaches from like Oregon Northwestern Stanford and the bleachers and um, my team, you know, we had Christian David, top 100 player, Tyreek Jones, who, you know, led the Big East in scoring and rebounding, and, and Bruce Brown, who plays with the Brooklyn Nets. So that was, um, it was surreal at first, Corey. Yeah, thanks for asking. <laughs> wild. I had to kind of take a step back. I'm like, wow, this is incredible, you know. Yeah. Um, I remember the first time I coached in Kentucky at my alma mater against my alma mater it, it was my pictures on the wall and it's weird walking through the gym it's like oh, this is uncomfortable but 
then when the game started, you wanted to beat the tar at your alma mater. So it, that disappears very quickly. Uh, the best player you ever coached against. That's a lot to choose from, I know. But maybe one that just maybe let you guys up. Donovan Mitchell at Brewster. Uh, sure. Okay. Um, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? Uh, hanging out with my wife and, and our our dogs and uh, dabble with some some tennis, some yoga, trying to stay in shape. Uh, but I'm a I'm a basketball junkie, you know. Um, I love going to practices. Uh, this weekend, I'm gonna take the three hour drive over to Fort Lauderdale and and check out a Division two program that averages over 100 points a game in uh, Nova Southeastern. Uh, Coach Crutchfield has invited me. You know, I've been to Dusty May's practice at FAU. I'm trying to, you know, I've gone to a couple of JUCO workouts. I'm kind of a basketball junkie all the way through Corey. So I'm always watching film, talking to coaches, um, just trying to, you know, get a little bit better and keep networking too. Because all the professional development stuff that I do um, to make myself better uh, as a coach for the future, it certainly supports our admissions and recruiting model here at IMG. So you end up getting, you know, good leads on prospects in, in the, uh, in the process. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to stick this question in for you specifically, because we've talked about books before, but name three of your one or two or three of your top books of all time. Books drop that on me. Um, I know, sorry, but it's just because you and I've had literary conversations. Yes. Yeah. Um, or one you're reading now that's stuck to you. No, recently. no, no. I want to do of all time. I'm okay. not going to pass on it. I'm not going <laughs> to pass on it. Um, probably Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell, mm -hmm. Talent Code, Daniel Coyle. Um, those would be the number one, and number two. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I don't think uh, those two have uh, much competition for me. Okay. How about you? What's your, I, I, we've obviously done the recommendation thing, but what's your favorites of all time? Uh, the book that's really, I've just, I've loved in the past few years is called Never Settle the Difference by Chris Voss. And it's about negotiation and he's an FBI, former FBI, FBI negotiator. And I use that with my kids, with my wife, with my uh, prep athletics, with um, everything in life. I've learned a couple of key things from there. It's just a, uh, not to like pull wool over anyone's eyes. It's just a way of communicating that I've found very valuable. And then um, I read Nelson Mandela's book probably 13 years ago and it read like an action book. I mean, I could not put it. It was a big old book and I couldn't put it down. I think that was long walk to freedom. And um, the only book I've ever check, read. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah, it's great. And uh, the one only book I've ever read twice in my life is alive. And that's where the rugby team in Argentina crashes and they have to in the middle of the Andes in the winter and they have to, start uh consuming the bodies of their dead teammates and family members to survive and as a high school freshman i was like you know i love stephen king in the day and that to me was just a book like how far you know i love asking questions and conversations like how much you know would you do the you know would you cut off your finger to get this result like i love those tough questions where you really got to think and that one is would you eat a family member to stay alive right and it happened right it was a true story um, so I read that one twice, but yeah, those are the top of my head. There's three random subjects, cannibalism, uh, a freedom fighter and then negotiation. <laughs> so, but I've got more, there's one last one. I think I recommend this to you. I think it's called one and none or one and done. And it goes into detail about all the NBA players that went straight to high school or, st or straight to the pros from the high school ranks. And we all know Kobe Garnett, uh, LeBron, this talks about guys that didn't make it, like your Leon Smiths, your Robert Swift, um, your Corleone Youngs. And to me, I found that fascinating because these are players you've been around uh, in your coaching days that are this talented. They could go to the league, but for one reason or another, they don't. And it goes through the decision-making process and who was mentoring them. And, um, and, and a lot of it, it's sad, but it just – I don't know. I just, I just, I could not put that book down. So I think it's called one and that, done. That one sounds like it's up my alley because it supports the conversations that we have all the time with, you know, the youngsters that we're working with. Right. So Absolutely. I'm going to have to check that out as well. And it, you will, you will, you'll, you'll finish in a few hours. It's that good. All right. Last thing here. Uh, and thank you for asking that. That's uh, 
Yeah, I love sharing and talking books. I just, I just, they're they're pretty. The John, you gotta check out the John Thompson book. By the way, that was really well done. Okay, I've heard that from more than one person. So, and then, um, when you mentioned Nelson Mandela's, I also a quote popped up in my head that I have to share with our with your listeners. Um, The Steve Jobs book is worth listening because he has this, you know. There's just so much good content in there. But one thing that stuck with me that I share with every single one of my players who I work with is Steve Jobs said, the first 25 years of your life, you create your habits. Mm. And then the next 25 years of your life, those habits create you. And so kind of approaching the details and the grind and the routine with youngsters, um, it's it's kind of a fun quote to kind of uh, bring up to support kind of the discomfort of, of uh, you know, the grind of becoming a better, you know, human being through the sport of basketball. Oh, absolutely. We need to have a book club almost and uh, put out our, I'm in. Our, our, yeah. Yeah. I'll listen to any suggestion you got book wise. Especially, especially if it's books on tape, right? Like I, I'm always in the car. <sighs> Audio books are my, are my go-to now. See, I disagree. I'm a podcast Guilty. guy in the car and I can just, I, my Kindle is one of the best. Do you have a Kindle? Is that what you use or is it strictly audiobooks? Uh, I guess, you know, old school, like, uh, you know, I'll flip through the pages and everything like that. Order uh, hard, hardback or, or soft cover on Amazon. And then, uh, like I said, books on tape. But I do not have a Kindle. Okay. I, I fought it for years because just like you, I loved highlighting and I loved the hard books. Once I got the Kindle, probably five years ago, it changed my life with reading. I, re- I just inhale books now and I take it everywhere and just, I've got constantly like six books queued up on six different topics that I just bounce between chapters on. So I'm constantly uh, just firing different neurons. But if a book comes out of the library or a hot one's up that I need to read now, I'll stop everything and blaze through that. So just, just a thought. I like it. Last time you gave me a technology uh, suggestion. I, yeah, exactly. I'm wearing them right now. I jumped two feet in. So um, I appreciate the, the recommendation, Corey. Yeah. Last question here. It's a fun one. Favorite movie of all time? Uh, it's a tie. Okay. That's it's allowed. A tie. Shawshank Redemption, which I we- think a couple of, you know, of your coaching guests have might have already mentioned. I mean, that's just an all time for me. Um, and then it, the tie is uh, Blue Chips, Nick Nolte, oh, Shaquille yeah. O'Neal, Penny Hardaway, and uh, Matt Nover, you know, Butch McCray, Neon Badeau, and Ricky Rowe, and uh, Coach Pete Bell. I saw that movie, Corey, in, I don't know, grade six. And um, some of the, some of the content was a little, over my head, but I walked out of that theater, um, you know, telling my dad, I, you know, I still want to be a, I want to be a coach when I grow up as a profession. And, um, it's funny to reflect back on because, um, blue chips was ahead of its time. Yeah. And we were in high school when that came out in Kentucky and one of my teammates in high school was Rick Pitino's son. And he was in that movie behind Rick as an extra when Rick was coaching against Nick Nolte. And so we were all howling, seeing our teammate on the big screen. And uh, we gave him a lot of, a lot of flack for that, but we were all jealous. I mean, I think that's what it came down to. So, and the only, the, what, there's a quick, great quote from that movie. It's uh, what is it? Southern Baptist or what was the first quote Baptist that, or first. And you could just see Nick Nolte and he's like, Oh, of course it's Southern Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> Pentecostal. I grew up at the Pentecostal church and he gets in there and he starts clapping. And um, yeah, that's a beautiful scene. Uh, is that Algier, Algiers, Louisiana. Yeah. Where uh, does that movie, have you, when's the last time you saw it? Cause I wonder if it still holds uh, up in 2021, or if it's really dated. I think it's aged nicely, you know, <laughs> like, like when uh, Nick Nolte shows up to, to Chicago to, St. Joseph's to recruit uh, Butch McRae. It's like Jerry Tarkanian and Jim Beheim in the stands there with them right. recruiting against them. Um, but I think for me personally, I, I find that Blue Chips is timeless. Oh, that's great. 
Well, Alex, a hey, great having you on the podcast. Finally, uh, you're one of my most ardent listeners, and I appreciate that. We we chat a lot. We share good wisdom, and I appreciate being a friend. Thanks, my man. Same to you. Great, keep up the great work, and uh, I'm glad I could you know join the legendary list of coaches that <laughs> that have been on this pod. No, seriously. I mean, it's it's funny to take a step back and and look at, but like I I do feel that way because you know. Uh, prep school basketball is just so important to me and it has been so important to my life. So um, I'm such a fan of, of all the coaches that you've hosted. So uh, thanks for having me be a part of this. Yeah, appreciate it. Good luck this season. Uh, if you guys like this, be sure to subscribe at YouTube and all the major podcasting platforms. And uh, thanks again for joining. And uh, all of Alex's contact information will be in the show notes. So if you want to reach out to Alex and learn more about IMG, he'll be more than happy to help you. So thanks so much. See you next week.